Betsy Ann Duval is an artist from Acton who works in painting, printmaking, sculpture, installation, and performance. Her work has received a number of impressive awards in national exhibitions. She has appeared solo and in group exhibitions in the United States and Europe. And she, her work is in private and corporate collections, including the National Museum of Women in the Arts Archives of Women Artists. She is represented by Bromfield Gallery, Boston Printed Matter, <coughs> New York, and Cambridge Art Association. Also of interest, Betsy Ann serves as a vocal court coach for students who are the recipients of the Helen Creeley Poetry Award in Acton annually, and she helps to coach uh, the recipients of the award uh, before they read before hundreds on the big day of the event of the Robert Creeley Poetry Foundation Award, something we know less about her. But here to share and talk about her own art today is Betsy Ann Duvall. One of the most interesting things about being an artist is trying to figure out, for me, where art comes from, where my art comes from. Um, when I meet people and I say I'm an artist, um, they invariably say, well, what is your medium? And today I think a lot of artists are defined by, by their materials or their media, uh, sculptures, painters, printmakers, um, ceramicists. But I believe that uh, artists are best defined by their ideas and how they execute them. So where do these ideas come from? They come from everywhere. And my job as an artist, which is lots of fun, is to find them. Um, so I spend a lot of time playing. And I play with random thoughts, and I play with things I hear, and I read, and I play with a lot of stuff in my studio. Um, so this is my home page um, of my website, and you'll see four images. Um, the first image, and these are all different works, uh, and each one was in a different exhibit. Um, the first is Veil, and it's an interactive sculpture. The next is a fresco-like painting on a plaster panel, uh, an abstract of the human form. Uh, the third is a monoprint called Lures. And the fourth piece is a performance piece where um, I address the problems of childhood obesity while wearing this life-size cabbage patch doll that eats Crisco sugar and salt. <laughs> This was my first solo exhibit, exhibition, not actually in this venue, but it's called Memory Stories. And it's made up of um, uh, long uh, Japanese scrolls on which I've painted and written and, um, and layered ink, paper, um, uh, oil. And uh, this happens to be at the Rhode Island uh, the St. John's School in Newport, Rhode Island, and it was a glass gallery, so it was absolutely perfect to see these three-dimensional floating scrolls. I started the scrolls by playing with um, a printing plate and covered it with oil paint, and then I sort of rolled the scroll on top of it and kind of worked on the back, so the paint transferred onto the scroll. Then I'd roll it up and I'd sort of do the next one, and I started feeling like I was making kind of chapters in a story, and it was, it was very zen-like. Um, and then when I'd finished it, I had the roll all rolled up and I hadn't sort of seen it. So I happened to have a very long corridor and I unrolled it. And um, it was really fascinating to me um, how the mark making seemed to represent the beginning of language. It was at this point that I began to think of these scrolls as memory stories, the stories and myths that are passed down orally through centuries uh, across cultures and continents to form our collective narrative. This piece um, was a scroll that looked just like the ones before. It was very kind of ethereal. And I thought I would just do one more layer of paint on it. And I did that. And it was awful. 
<laughs> it was awful. I was so upset. And, you know, I was so upset I just put it aside. But my show was coming up, so I, I, I was really kind of anxious about it because it was sort of one of the long ones. Um, so I would just go back, I, while I worked on the others, I would just go back and maybe do another layer of ink or paint or print oil. Um, and it got thicker and thicker and denser and denser. And it got to be like a... Um, uh, uh, skin, like animal skin, and it gave me the idea, it seemed to me like a cave painting, and it, then it gave me the idea to build a sculpture out of it. So I built a vine armature, and then I took the scroll and wrapped it all around the vine, and it became this creature layer, which became the centerpiece of the show. Um, this is uh, another exhibition. It's completely different than the previous one. And the idea for this uh, came to me when I was messing around with stuff in my studio. And I was playing with these teeth molds that the dentist had made for my husband when um, he, he got a crown made. And I, I just started, I thought of this idea and just started laughing of putting the uh, rose in the teeth molds. And then I thought, that is so funny. Um, this is juxtaposition of these, these funny things. And so then I built this little box and I added um, a motion detector and some sound. So when you walked toward it, it played flamenco music. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and then from that idea, I thought, well, you know, I, I have another show coming up in, in two years. This is, this is kind of fun. I'm going to make uh, everything in this show be somehow interactive so that people who come can, can interact with it. And um, so I started making a whole series of uh, different things. Um, this piece um, uh, is, was in the show and it, it was called Memory Music Box and it started with these envelopes. And the envelope started um, because after my father's death, I was looking through old albums that he had and the album that um, I was looking through was was about my grandparents on my father's side that I had never known because um, they had died before I was born and I got to thinking about how connected we were and yet disconnected we were so I took the some of the love letters and some of the pictures that were in the album and I put them into these glassine envelopes and I mailed them to myself and when they came back to me in the mail, it was so, I felt so connected to them. And they were really emotionally charged. Excuse me. Um, so I, um, I sort of stitched them all together. And then I would take them as a performance piece to a, a dinner party with friends or with a group of, of maybe women, business women. And I would, I would pass them to people. And people would look at them, and they would start looking at the pictures, and then they would, you know, maybe take something out, and then they would look up. And because they were all stitched together, they realized that all the people I'd given envelopes to were all stitched together, too. And I thought that was really kind of neat. And then they became, as I said, so emotionally charged, I wanted to keep them safe. And about the same time, I had started using some of these images in paintings, and I was doing these um, sort of two foot by two foot paintings. And um, I was cutting holes in the paintings and putting these glassine prints that, of the images that I made in the paintings so that you could sort of, they were sort of translucent. And I thought, um, I could make these into a box. So I made them into a box. And um, I put a light in the bottom of the box so light came through the little painting insets that you can see. And then I put a false top on the box so I could put my envelopes inside. And when people came to the show and they opened the lid of the box, it played my father's favorite Frank Sinatra song. <laughs> this is a sculptural piece and also a performance piece called Veil. Um, and uh, I got the idea for this piece when I was having a facial and I was lying there on this white table with a sheet over me and waiting for this moisture mask to harden and I was thinking, why do we spend so much time on our exterior, on our outside, when it's what's inside that, that really is important? Um, so from this idea, I built metal 
frames and covered them with four-way polar tech, stretch polar tech, um, and left an opening in the back so people could slip inside and be in a nice safe place where they could let their inside out. I also did, um, I got three dancers together. These are actually images from the three dancers. And to a Bach cantata, uh, we all did um, sort of a dance performance. And the iconic sculptures represented um, uh, the wildness of youth, the sensual maturity of the middle-aged woman, and the wisdom of the crone. This show is another exhibition. It's called Flesh and Bones. It started with a series of intimate uh, paintings of the human body uh, called, that I call bodyscapes. Um, and these bodyscapes were uh, made uh, with oil pigment on uh, plaster on panels. And they were like frescoes, so they had a lot of luminosity to them. It's hard to see them in the image. Um, but they also got me thinking about the vulnerability of human beings. I mean, we're, we don't have fur, and we don't have teeth, and we don't have claws, and we're so naked. Um, and we're so vulnerable, and we're vulnerable to our own kind. Um, and it was the run-up to the Iraq War, uh, with all the talk about weapons of mass destruction. And, um, and that got me, it gave me the idea to start working on a, a sculptural piece that I could juxtapose with these large paintings um, that, would, um, that would address the uh, brutality of war. So I did this large floor sculpture. It was 25 combat boots, and out of the combat boots there would be body parts. And it's called collateral damage. This exhibition, I object, or I object, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, um, is a, a, a show about how um, women and their bodies have been treated in art through the years. And it really kind of wonders how women artists view their roles in the art world, both, both as artists and as objects. Um, so it's a, it was a series of paintings uh, with one sculptural piece. Um, the sculptural piece in the foreground is um, holding the enigmatic face of the Mona Lisa. Perhaps she was thinking about being an object at the time as well. And uh, this person or this sculpture represents the observer. And every painting, and there were about 10 paintings in the show, always feature a nude from the rear as one always sees women portrayed in commercials, particularly beer commercials, always from the back. Um, and she is always observing a piece of art. So she and the artwork are in communication, very connected. And there's always something going on in the middle ground. And the middle ground is always, you know, related in some way to the image. But, you know, she's ignoring it and the people in the middle ground are ignoring her. And, uh, you know, does she wonder, am I an object or am I art? <laughs> and this was a series I did called Supermodels. Um, and it, I did it to explore the women who influenced me um, in my life. Uh, and I wanted to honor them. And I did these large scale uh, charcoal drawings. They're very big. They're about three feet by four feet. Um, and. Uh, uh, as I researched them, their lives, and uh, I, I, I discovered how much broader and deeper they were than what we know of them in their public persona. This is Anne Sexton, the poet. Um, this is Martha Graham, the wonderful pioneering dancer choreographer. And this is Marlena Dietrich, who, among all her other talents, played a major role in the resistance in World War II. Um, when I um, presented this exhibition. The, the space was, I would say, about half the size of this room, and I had 20 charcoal drawings, so I had two rows on all four walls, and I can tell you those eyes of those women looking at you in that gallery was really wonderful. <laughs> 
Which brings me to um, kind of where I am now. I've been doing these, I started about four or five years ago working with post-it notes. And um, I started, I, was, I have a creative group and we did these creative exercises using these post-it notes. And they've become for me a durational performance. I have continued them over the years now. I started using them like a sketch pad. Uh, to record places or scenes or to explore or capture a moment in time. Um, and then I use them also as exercises to springboard ideas for paintings or for uh, other media. Um, and uh, these notes are a timed visualization exercise and what I was doing was visualizing as I did them within a very tight time frame, a waterfall that I had hiked up to in Hawaii. Um, so the notes have become for me a way of capturing memories. And over the last two years, uh, over about two years ago when I had my last show, and I had done two years worth of notes and I had a lot of them, um, I started thinking about um, playing around with these and changing their scale and level of abstraction and doing these paintings. And they became this show called Infinite Progression. Um, and unlike infinite regressions um, that go ever backwards, I saw these paintings as progressions that go ever forwards. So I did a series of paintings. The, the paintings on the left <laughs> um, are, uh, uh, where I took started with the post-it notes and then I did these six eight by eight paintings and I took smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of that little post-it note and they became more and more and more abstracted and then I made this six foot by six foot painting um, out of one of the abstraction which was kind of in the middle which was really fun to work with those different scales and kind of play around with these visual ideas um, and then on this side, um, I just played with the scale initially, and I made took the post-it note and then made it larger and then made it larger. And then I just kind of took off like a jazz riff and started making um, uh, oil paintings on these little panels, which was a lot of fun. And, uh, and that was enjoyable. Um, this series, um, as you saw in that in that last slide, the whole gallery was, uh, I completely surrounded all the whole gallery with post-it notes. And I also had stations where people could make their own post-it notes, which was very, everybody loved that. Um, uh, but this was one of the, this was one of the series of post-it notes. And um, I liked it especially because it was an exercise I did with my creative group. And we all decided we were going to create our own personal myth by doing these post-it note drawings. So we gave ourselves an hour and we got to do our personal myth in an hour. And uh, the absurdity of it was what made it so much fun. And so this was, this was my personal myth. And I thought, well, you know, what am I gonna do with this? I, I really like these paintings. I mean, I like these little paintings and, and it's my personal myth. So um, I got this idea from Ron Paget. Uh, the poet Ron Paget. He wrote this wonderful little haiku, maybe. Um, so I did that and I thought, yeah, yeah, that, that's true. You know, life, that was fast. Um, so I turned my, I turned my post-it notes into a visual memoir. And this is my visual memoir. It's 12, three foot by three foot paintings or chapters really that are sort of one continuous painting and they're punctuated by um, these wrapped sculptures that I make that are that in incorporate as I wrap them I think about personal memories or in some cases the anxieties that uh, time generates uh, playing its endless tricks on us going so slowly when we're five and going so fast when we're well over that um, and so, this is my new show. It's opening November. Um, I hope you'll join me in Boston at the Bromfield Gallery for the opening. And this first painting is the beginning of um, my life. It's called Where Am I? And, um, 
Some of the other titles are Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, and I'm Swimming as Fast as I Can, uh, and of course, wow, that was fast. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'd love to take some questions. Please repeat the question. Before. Yeah, remind me. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, what, uh, when you allowed people to do post-it notes, were they using ink or pen? Crayons. 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 Um, I use, uh, on the post-it notes, I almost always use crayposh crayons. They're really lovely, soft, and kind of waxy. And um, and then for the lines, I usually use just a Sharpie. That You have to just use it delicately, but it, it works. So I set up tables with post-it notes and just lots of crayposh crayons, and people made wonderful, they, wonderful notes. And we put, them, we put them on the front of the gallery, and the gallery has glass windows in the front. So I put all the post-it notes facing out and facing in. So, and uh, there were a lot it, it was at the first Fridays in Sowa in the Arts District in Boston. Um, and the first Friday is just packed with people, and lots of young people and students. And it, it, it was just mobbed because they got to make art. And one of the posted notes said, um, I made art today. What did you do? Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. I'm fascinated by the way in which your style seems to change. Do you find that you'll go for a while with a particular style and then feel the need to change strongly, or does it, does it come really fast? Okay, the, the question is, um, I use a lot of different styles, and do I work um, in one style and then change to another? Or how, does, how, do I, how does that happen? Um, it happens based on the ideas. It happens on the ideas. Um, I tend not to go back and, and do the same thing again, but I, I use the same media sometimes over and over. Um, it's just an idea. I, come, I, I get an idea, and I start thinking about it, and it turns into a concept. I start sort of building a concept around it. And then once I have the concept kind of defined in my mind, which is all kind of heady, um, I start playing with different materials, and then playing with the materials kind of sparks, and with the concept of mine, sort of sparks how, what I do. Um, sometimes it's a performance, and sometimes it's a sculpture, and sometimes it's a painting, and, and who knows, I, I, you know. <laughs> um, I, you know. I just don't know, but that's, that's how it works. It's just kind of, it's kind of fluid. It's, it's kind of magical. It just kind of happens. Um, I think starting with the idea and the concept just sort of lets me be free to be. be. Yeah, come up with something. Any other? Yes. How do you learn to trust your instincts and go with them? How do you have that confidence? How do I learn to trust my instincts? How do I have the confidence? Um, you know, I, I have to say um, it's a real struggle. Uh, for, I think for all artists to come to that trust in themselves. And I've been working on it for a long time. I actually do a lot of these exercises that I talk about to get me away from thinking about what I'm doing um, to just doing uh, it. And, um, and uh, I think the more you do exercises, the more you just play the more play, and it can just be play in your head. It doesn't have to be, you know, in a studio or something. Uh, it gives you a, just a lot more um, uh, ability to be confident because you all of a sudden just find yourself doing something. And once you're doing, you know, you're not thinking about having to do it or worrying about having to do it. Um, you're just doing it. Uh, and so it isn't a matter of confidence. It's just your 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 already going forward. I, but I, I have to say this, I have a show with my gallery every two years, and, um, and you know, once I finally get, it's awful trying to think about something, and I just have to 
stop myself from thinking and play. And then once I get going, uh, it's fine and everything's wonderful until about the month before the show and then I think, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, it's really it's so strange. But uh, it, it always turns out fine. And by the time the show comes, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm confident again. But, you know, there's always that, that period when you're not. And it's the more you're thinking about it. The more you're thinking about it, and the more you let those voices in your head um, of, you know, all the people who you are concerned about the parents and your husband. And, you know, will they, what will people think? You get that, you gotta get rid of that. Just have to get rid of it. That's great, I, we're out of time great. now, but thank you so much. Thank you. She pulls charcoal in wide sweeps, shades cheekbone, gives the eye unlidded, unlidded glare, a, sh a jaw, hint of hunger. Her cave lion flickers in firelight as it watches three bison, one above the other, on a rock woof, rock, rough rock wall. From memory's retina, she sketches the profile, staring, alert, draws a dotted muzzle, mouth ajar. She is old woman, with a single white hair on her chin. She is child, reaching in on ten toes. She is seed that swallows earth, lens that freezes motion, hand that startles a trekking heart 36,000 years hence. Thank you.